The American grading system comprises the marking of proficiency, progress, and success of a student into a single letter that determines the success or failure of a student. Each class upholds a single letter that marks the student's progress over a span of time, and that, in essence, is the American grading system. It can be seen in fundamentally every school within the United States. We utilize the same conventional system on Jupiter, and in addition, we also use the number system. They both function in the same way and evaluate students identically. But despite being the standard, the letter grading system consists of numerous flaws. This video intends to explore the numerous effects of letter grading in our system by depicting the shortcomings of our grading structure, while also dive into an alternative substitute that attempts to rectify some of those shortcomings. Grading as a practice was not always associated with education. During the Enlightenment, American schools were hierarchically ordered, much like the American workforce. Grades replicated that workforce, and grades were competitive in the sense that people were competing with one another for a higher grade, whereas now grades simply reflect the progress of students based on a rubric or grading criteria. So during the Enlightenment, as schools grew rapidly in size and number through the 19th and 20th centuries, grades became a primary mode of communication among institutions that needed a way to coordinate with one another. Grades needed to have an objectively determined meaning that could be interpreted by any third party. So the idea of letter and number grades arose and is now the standard in schools. But despite being the standard, the letter grading system grasps numerous flaws including objectivity, an objective that institutions try to find a solution to, but never succeeded. More specifically, the lack of objectivism occurs in teacher evaluation of student work. Teacher bias can be influenced consciously or unconsciously, and bias is everywhere within our school system. Student work can be graded differently by varying individuals despite using the same evaluation criteria. Here are a few examples. If a teacher decides to weigh exams as 50% of a student's grade, and another teacher decides it should only be 30, then the impact of an assignment can therefore mean more for a student and less for another. Another example comes from the accountability of a teacher's condition while they grade. The question stands whether the teacher graded the first paper, the one he or she did right after dinner when the teacher was full and in a good mood, on the same relative scale as the last paper when he or she was exhausted and wanted to go to bed. These biases, therefore, can make grades seem arbitrary and meaningless because the same symbol can be used to convey a multitude of different information about a student's learning, success, and understanding without certainty and consistency across teachers, schools, and even districts. However, it is important to note that this issue is not directly an effect of the grading system, but more of an individual's own values and criteria when grading a student's work. What's problematic is this variable can't easily be solved because individuals may have different benchmarks, and as a result, alternative judgments on the same situation. Although bias can't be solved just by altering the grading system, another issue that our standard structure faces are the many facets of student learning. By diminishing a student's learning progress to solely a letter, it fails to holistically capture a student's desire to learn or perseverance to do so. Researchers and professors have been trying to find ways to better comprehensively assess a student's learning progress, and the result of that is the Proficiency-Based Learning System, or PBL for short. PBL is sometimes referred to as standards-based or competency-based and even mastery-based learning but the system attempts to ameliorate some of the defects in our ordinary evaluation of student progress. In essence, PBL is designed to identify, address, and solve the gaps in our traditional system to provide equitable learning opportunities for every student. A quick note, however, the PBL that is being referred to in this video primarily addresses and resembles the PBL I experienced in Vermont, where I experienced a school environment that really attempted to shift towards proficiency-based learning. But continuing on, in practice, PBL's evaluation of student learning consists of five tiers. Getting started, equating to one, making progress, two, and subsequently basic proficient, proficient, and proficient with distinction, marking five. It is similar to rubrics we would currently see, but the PBL rubric, in theory, should be more in-depth compared to the traditional system, and a student's work ethic, along with their participation, should also be accounted for in the final grade. 
The fundamental aspects of PBL, according to the Vermont Agency of Education, describes key features in a proficiency-based learning environment. They say that the environment should be welcoming, caring, and safe because learning involves taking risks and making mistakes. Students share responsibility for their own learning rather than the teacher or the parent taking responsibility for them. Students have a voice in determining how they will learn and demonstrate their learning. Assessments are customized for students. Rubrics, or scoring guides, are used to assess whether students have met the standards in order to keep performance levels high even though the specific demonstrations of learning may vary. Students are allowed to move at different paces through the learning process. Students understand the learning goals and the level of thinking required to demonstrate proficiency. And lastly, students are grouped and regrouped as needed, depending on what they need to learn next. Summarizing some of these points, PBL is basically saying, rather than grading a student solely on the work they hand in, PBL also aims to take into account the dedication put behind the work. What can be depicted from the Agency of Education is that in a PBL environment, students should be more opportune to make mistakes while also being able to adjust their own education geared and customized for the individual. Ultimately, this means that students should naturally have more authority in their own learning because the evaluation will fall upon the student's own customized custom. And you might be thinking, all of these fundamental goals seem extremely radical and difficult to achieve. And that's because it is. It calls for a restructuring of our entire educational system. When PBL was enacted in Vermont, schools erupted in confusion and perplexity. The main cause of all this chaos was the amount of ambiguity in the core structure of PBL. Rowan Keller, a friend and a student that attends Stowe High School, claimed that there was confusion at both the student and faculty level. The implementation of PBL wasn't planned out very well, which left the teachers just guessing and putting something together, which in turn just confused students even more. Teachers were overwhelmed with the sudden change in structure, and each school was left on their own to integrate and create guidelines that obliged PBL. Another issue was how our current grading structure limits how far PBL can actually reach. An example of that is our current Common Core standards. Zach Roger, another close friend who goes to People's Academy, claims that because schools are required to meet a national standard of required classes, the initiative to adapt each student's schedule to their own choice is rather limited. The requirements strip some liberty in the customization of student schedules as a direct result. So with all the confusion and incompatibility of having an extremely radical system replace a traditional system that has been ingrained so deep in our school structures, teachers had to find ways to meet the standards of both systems and would often end up with a wide variety of evaluation. Some teachers would set extremely high standards and others extremely low standards of proficiency for students. But despite the confusion and inconsistency, there are some benefits within the classes itself. Students are able to explore and utilize more independent ways of learning a certain topic if they don't understand how the teacher describes it. The pressure from maintaining exceptional grades are slightly lowered for students because the evaluation now takes into account engagement and focus. And dual enrollment is also available for a student if they desire college credits during their high school years. In essence, it is feasible to recognize the numerous flaws of our traditional system. But despite that, what PBL sets out to accomplish and succeed ultimately develops even more complications. Issues of the letter system like teacher bias in the grading structure and the fragmented evaluation of a student's learning meant to be solved by PBL only caused further difficulty. Bias was not solved because there was no explicit rubric all schools followed. And although PBL does take a more holistic view, the inconsistency across schools is a greater loss than the benefits of accounting, engagement, and participation. Without a consistent grade throughout schools, it can lead to both inflation and false placement of a student's learning progress. So until the issues of PBL are solved, we have to continue with letter and number grades, and the beneficial aspects that PBL provides is simply not enough to outweigh the issues PBL arises.